Coming up on episode 110 of Creative Writing, I'm talking with Chris Syme about how to find more readers and sell more books. I can't go back to sleep, it's almost light. These restless thoughts have kept me up again tonight. Hello and welcome to Create If Writing. I'm your host, Kirsten Oliphant, and I want to welcome you, a writer, blogger, or creative who wants to build an online platform without being smarmy. And today we are talking about building that online platform specifically in the book sense, how you can find more readers and how you can connect with them to sell more books on social media. I'm welcoming a guest for this episode in my series. This is actually the fourth in the series. And it's Chris Syme, who is also in episode 89 of the podcast talking about strategies to sell books with social media. Chris is a social media expert and the head of the award-winning CK Syme Media Group. I love talking to her because I feel like I know a lot about social media, but then I talk to her and it's like, totally level up. So we're going to dive deep and talk about how you can actually use platforms to connect with readers, how you can sell more books, which platform you should be on, and even more. So before we dive in, I just want to remind you that you can find the show notes at createifwriting.com forward slash 110 and stay tuned for the end of the episode where I'm going to give you lots more details about where you can connect with me, where you can connect with Chris, and also about my lovely patrons for the show. Just a brief note about this episode, I had a big spill where I poured a cup of coffee, you know, just into my computer, whatever. It's stuff that happens in my life. Thankfully, my computer is fine after a few days of letting it dry out and rest and some panicky moments and going to the Apple store on the day they released a new iPhone, whatever. It was a little crazy last week. So I had to use my husband's computer and record through Zoom. And I just, it doesn't sound quite as good. The editing was a little different. So anyway, it may sound a little different than it normally does in terms of the interview itself. So that's why. Just wanted to make a note. Podcasters love to note these sound differences. And you guys may or may not notice, but we feel like we have to tell you. So now you know. Let's dig in. On today's show, I am welcoming Chris Syme. Again, you are, I think, the second person to be on here twice. So welcome. I'm really happy you're here. I feel really privileged. (laughs) You are. You are. Well, you are someone I look to for, So, I mean, I love social media stuff, but you're someone I look to for great social media advice. I mean, you have been doing this a lot longer than I have. Um, And so when I started doing the series, thinking about why people's audiences are not growing and wanted to kind of delve into books and readership. So not just blog readers, not just social media, although all these things really, they're all connected, right? But specifically kind of looking at book things, I wanted to ask you. um, So I kind of thought we would start with maybe the people who already have books like on Amazon. uh, Because I think a lot of people, we know we can self-publish, we know we can do it independently and we do it. And then we have a book up there and then we're like, there it is. (laughs) There's our book. And nothing happens, right? It's, not, it's right. just kind of sitting there. So what are some of the reasons that people who have books up there are kind of struggling to find readers and make sales? Well, can we talk about the elephant in the room first? Yes. Because we need to say, if your books are not good, they're not going to sell. And that is the hardest thing for an author to come to grips with. But I don't like to be a bearer of bad news without balancing this out. And the truth of the matter is, is that most fiction authors, first, second, maybe even third, maybe even a whole series that they write initially probably isn't that great. (laughs) So I think the um, biggest mistake, and, and this is the elephant in the room that I think authors make, is in hoping that that first book is going to be something special for everybody. And the truth probably is that maybe they need um, a little bit better editing. Maybe they need to take a few courses in plotting or character development, or if if they're writing mysteries or crime, things that are related to that. Or if they're writing histories, maybe they need need to research a little bit better. I've just worked with too many authors whose 
books, first books are, are, they don't treat them as learning experiences. And when you're treating your first book as a learning experience, you have to be really careful how much stock you put in in how well it sells. And so that's the elephant in the room. I think if we all just took a deep breath, put on our, you know, big girl panties or whatever, <laughs> you know, it's our boy, if there's guys listening, um, it's, it's one of those deals where you just have to figure that first book may be a throwaway and it may not. Um, it, and so let's get real. Failure is the path to success. I mean, if you don't, if you're not willing to fail, if you're not willing to have your feelings hurt by bad reviews, if you're not willing to fail, you're never going to grow because you can grow from success only so far. It's really the failures that bring you the biggest success. So, so grit your teeth. Um, be, you know, be confident that that book is going to be a, a trouble for a while until you figure out your stroke or whatever, you know, but I think that's the elephant in the room. So once we get rid of that, I, I think that we are all on a totally different plane where we've got a new mindset that says, okay, the book isn't selling. Let's find out why. If you got a little email list or you have some reviewers, send them an email and ask them, uh, what's, what, are there some trouble spots in the book? This is why beta readers and advanced reviewers can really be gold. Um, but if you don't, if you don't have the necessary marketing pieces in place, that's one thing. If you have a book that needs more work, that's another thing. So let's talk about the marketing pieces. Um, one of the problems I think that the reasons that books don't sell, and I'm just going to be, I have no other option but to be real. So please, if, please be if real. <laughs> I, if I offend your sensibilities out there, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to tell you, tell you like it is. I've been in marketing for 20 years. I've, I've helped sell everything from um, ESPN football games to uh, refrigerators to uh, harmonicas to universities to books and everything in between. And, but it's all the same. It's all the same. If you don't, if you're not willing to do the work that it takes to sell correctly, you're going to, you know, have a little bit of a roller coaster. It's going to be like you're shooting darts at a target blindfold. And, and let me tell you how that looks for most authors. Let's say I'm an indie author and I got my first book out there and I think, oh, I got to do something. It's only sold, you know, five copies and four of them were to relatives. I have to do something right now. So I go online and I start looking at, um, you know, The Right Life and Ally and all these different sites that indies frequent where they have these succeed like me stories, I call them. In marketing, we call them case studies. And now there's nothing wrong with that. But the biggest mistake that new authors make is they fail to look only at case studies of new authors. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so they run out and they start copying tactics with no why. I have no idea why I'm doing this, but Sue Brown over here writes in the same genre I had. She sold 5,000 books in 30 days on Kindle by doing this. So by golly, I'm going to do that. With no, no thought to the why, no thought to, is her platform like my platform? How many books does she have? How many books do I have? You know, there, there's so many moving pieces. In, in the indie world, as far as platform levels, the bottom line for me, how many books do you have? How, what's your social media following like? What's your email list like? How many authors do you know in your author network? Those are four key pieces you really need to take a look at before you start copying what other people are doing. Because if you're just me, you remember, I'm that new author who's only sold five books and four of them are to my family. If I try and copy Sue Brown, who's got a series completed, and she still considers herself a new author. And I'm not going to be able to do that. I don't have the sell through. I don't have the backlist. I, there's just, you know, I could go on for years, but I think you're starting to get the idea here. There's too many markers here, too many moving pieces to be able to say why your books aren't selling. But here's one tip. If you're not working hard at selling books strategically, that means using just starting at that base, just saying, you know, I hear all this stuff from authors about, oh, you can't, you know, don't, don't mess with my jam. You know, I love Tumblr. And I'm like, oh, good. How many people are there? You know, it's, it's, the idea is to start with that basic platform that we know succeeds, the website, the Facebook page, the uh, email list, 
And you get that down and you work hard at it. You read how to do these things well. You learn from reputable people that are willing to work with you as a beginner, not as a New York Times bestseller. And then you build and then you find out, oh, I got a little bit of time left here. I can maybe try out Instagram or I could maybe try out Pinterest. But the bottom line is, and I say this at the end of every single one of my podcasts, the best marketing strategy is writing the next book. Mm. And we all, you know, nod our head and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But none of us, do. are we believing it? Are we buying into it? Most of the new authors that I talk to um, are spending more time marketing than they're spending writing. Mm. Now that's whacked out. Yeah. There, there's something wrong with that picture. Um, you're marketing at whatever level you're at. I don't care if you're a first time author, haven't even published yet, or if you got, you know, 100 books. If, if marketing is your whole day's activity, you're, I would say you've got a serious case of FOMO. And you need to fix that right away. You need to, be, you need to quit being afraid of what you're missing out on <laughs> and start putting into practice what you know works. And we know that these things work. They're not the only things that work, but I know the data is on, on my side when I say get a Facebook book page, start a website, build an email list. I know the numbers tell me that's good. So just get that going. And above all, you know, this is a long winded answer. Don't worry that your books aren't selling if you're a brand new author, just keep working and find like minded authors that are as discouraged about it as you are. <laughs> And cry on each other's shoulder and then, by golly, go sit back down in your office and write 5,000 more words. You know, I mean, mm. it's this idea that we're, when we ask this question, and I'm not talking about you because I know we're just being the devil's advocates. When we ask this question, are we saying that we really don't want to write mm. any more books? Do I write one book and put it out there and wait and see if that sells? And if it doesn't, then do I declare that, that, that I'm not, I can't be an author? Hmm. Or do I write book after book after book after book and keep putting them out there and doing the things that I know is working, especially building an author network, building an email list, building true fans, whatever that takes, and working hard at it, it'll come. Unless your books are absolute crap and you're not willing to work at the craft. Yeah. Because I've always said the best marketing in the world will not sell a poor book. Yeah. And there's so many things I want to touch on. I'm trying to decide where to start from that answer, which was fantastic. Not long-winded. It was excellent. Um, I want to come back to specific platforms because we talked a little bit about that before we uh, started recording. But before that even... It thinking about, you know, putting out a really quality product and kind of thinking about the author network. Cause uh, let me just, I'll say this and then kind of form it into a question, but uh, you and I are in some of the same author groups. And I think I, you know, I'm, I've been a writer for as long as I can remember, you know, and I got my MFA and then, you know, like MFA writers, it's like a different world. Like they're not in a lot of these writers groups that I'm in. Right, they're right doing their thing. Um, nothing against MFA people, the students I was with, I love them. They're awesome. But there's just a difference between some of the groups I'm in with them where we're just kind of hanging out and the groups where there are indie authors who are trying to make a living. And some of the things that I've been hearing in these groups, like I didn't know what I didn't know until I started listening <laughs> in these groups and just even reading the questions that people had. And, you know, someone was asking a question, for example, I don't write in the romance genres. So I don't know, you know, what, going on in there as far as tropes and different things. And somebody was asking a question about like, how do I categorize my book? Because someone's having an affair in it. So it can't be romance. And I was like, why not? Because I don't know. Because I don't do romance. I don't read. I don't write it. And I was reading all the comments. And apparently that's like a giant rule in romance. And if I had just decided like, I feel like writing romance without connecting, you know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like there's this yeah. disconnect where if you're trying to just write a book without connecting you know, to your genre and without connecting with other authors where you're going to get that feedback, you know, because they were like, you're picking the wrong category. And the same thing with somebody else who wrote some kind of teen dystopian thing. They had it in children's market in the Amazon children's category. And, and like, there were like 80 comments. This is not in the children's category. And so there's something that's really important about, you know, not just putting out that quality product, but like 
knowing where it goes and Amazon and some of these key things where I feel like I wouldn't know this if I weren't hanging out with other authors and listening to like this or being willing to put myself out there and ask that question like, can I categorize this as romance? I really want to. And having everybody say no, <laughs> you actually um, can't do that. So, um, you know, ha- have you found that, you know, if you're coming to it from kind of the standpoint of trying to make sure your book, I mean, we want to get our work out there. We want to keep writing, but to make sure that your book isn't crap and to make sure it's, you know, in the right categories and all those things, like, have you found or what have you found has been helpful for, for that to make sure you're producing a quality product that also is kind of ticking the right boxes in terms of like where it needs to be and all of those kinds of things. Well, I think there's kind of three things that an author needs to do there. And I'll see if I can remember all these. (laughs) The first one we already talked about, and that's, you have to build an author network. You very uh, well, you, you articulated that very well. These are the people that are in your same boat. You just have to be careful where you're at when you're listening to advice. Um, I, there are a lot of author forums I'm not a big fan of, um, and there are other author forums I think are very helpful. So first and foremost, I think it, genre is important. So find a group of people in your own genre. Um, second of all, you really need to make use of beta readers. Mm. Um, and sometimes they're hard to find, but we... Um, I have an advantage in that I live in a university town that, that has a, a good um, English literature major, and lots of times those people are well-trained and are, are um, interested in helping you out. The best piece of advice I ever got about beta readers was they can't be your friends <laughs> mm-hmm. because beta readers are, that are your friends are going to be afraid to tell you the truth. Um, and if, if you can't, you can't find beta readers without having to pay them. Then you're going to have to do some creative finding. Um, editors are also good for this. If you can afford a developmental ed- development editor, sometimes they'll help you out with that. Often, oftentimes authors in your own genre will be willing to read pieces of your book to tell you if you're on the right track. I'm not a big fan, as I said earlier, of just putting the call out there in a general big, you know, author Facebook group, because a lot of authors don't know what they're doing. So I would be, I would be really hesitant about that. Um, So it's networking beta readers. And and the, I think the other thing is to educate yourself. Um, I'm on the marketing side of the book. So I'm on everything that's outside the book. Um, My daughter's a little bit more on the inside of the book. And uh, so she takes and teaches both classes in the writing craft. And there are a lot of really good writing teachers out there and good classes to take, and they're not very expensive. Um, If you've got more money to burn, then you can maybe go to a a really nice, uh, very intense retreat. Uh, My daughter goes to one with her writing uh, group in Colorado every year. This gal takes about four or five people at one time. I know Shelly Hitz does the same thing. She takes uh, small groups of writers and works with them. Um, There's a lot of things that you can do to make your books better. Um, I just, we touched on this and I think we're going to talk about a little bit more, but those writer um, author groups on Facebook, they kind of scare me. I think you really have to vet where you go there, but, but network, find good beta readers, um, and or advanced readers that you trust after you've edited your book and and go from there. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about the social piece and about the promotional piece because I know that's sort of your specialty. You have a really great book called um, "Selling More Book" or "Selling More with Less Social Media," uh, which is fantastic because that's the dream, right? You want to do less social media and sell more books. So, uh, you mentioned kind of the standard platforms that we should be on. So let's go a little bit deeper there. Like, why are those the standard platforms that people should be on? Because I have people asking me this all the time and I'm like, I have my favorites and um, (laughs) the ones I know that work, but what has been your experience that where people absolutely have to be and kind of why also? Well, I think the easiest way to approach this is just to talk about numbers or data because if you're just looking to do social media well, you don't need to be on a lot of platforms. Um, I find that many authors 
will uh, go to platforms that they personally like, and then they will try and build something there. And that's great for engagement. But if you pick the wrong platform, you're not going to sell anything there. Mm. And I think, so what are your goals? I guess let's start out. Let's start out talking about goals with, with, um, with social media. What do you want to do? Do you just want to have conversations and share your life with, with people that might be potential fans? You can go anywhere and do that. You can do that on your personal profile if you want to do that, but I don't recommend that. And because people I work with normally are people that want to make business, that writing their business, um, we have to have a two prong goal there, and that's to sell books and build raving fans. So that changes the landscape a little bit because in order to do both of those in the same place, because you can't sell without engaging. You don't win the right to sell to people without engaging them first. And, and I use that 80, 20 rule to kind of say that you got to give value 80% of the time and sell 20% of the time. And if you're not doing that, that's your first mistake, but let's go back to numbers. So when I look at numbers, I, I look at four at a couple of different markers here and I'm, I'm going to use a cheat sheet cause I don't want to miss this. In that book I talked about, and in my book, uh, the last one about the newbie's guide to selling more, more books with less marketing, I talk about markers that you need to take a look at to decide where you're going to be. And when it comes to social media, the first one is just universal numbers. Who has the most people across all the age groups that you need to sell to? And there's just nobody that beats Facebook, I'm sorry, but with 70, 80% of the online adults 13 years old and over that's your go-to spot. And, and it's interesting to me because people say, oh yeah, Facebook, but nobody's on Facebook. They just have platforms. And, you know, I look at data on monthly engagement and Facebook still <laughs> is the biggest platform out there by so far. Just, you know, they've got 80% of the online adults. I think the next one, which is now Instagram, by the way, has just a little over 30%. Uh, Pinterest and, and uh, Twitter are fighting for the next place, but Pinterest is going up and Twitter is going down. So it's not going to be long until Twitter's, I, I believe Twitter will be less than 20% of online adults by the end of 2018, if it still even exists. Mm -hmm. It's just fading. They can't figure themselves out. And they just had a hard time um, selling anything on Twitter. Um, so the other piece of data that I look at when I'm deciding which social media platforms I'm going to use is how well does that platform sell? And if you're not a marketer, you're probably not thinking about this, but there is some good research out there because there are marketers out there that need to know which platform sells better than others because they're out there trying to sell ads. And so they need to know this stuff. So there was a great survey done, a piece of research done in 2016, end of 2015 it was, um, by AOL. Uh, that actually showed the effectiveness of each social media platform in relationship to the funnel, you know, the sales funnel. So you start with discovery, you know, getting those new readers in that funnel. Then you go to the awareness piece in the middle there where, you, where you're getting more loyalty out of those people. And then you go to the bottom and that's the sales piece. And of, of the top five social media channels at that time, which Instagram wasn't on the radar yet because they just shot up after Facebook bought them. Um, Facebook and YouTube were at the top and YouTube is a unique channel. It doesn't really work for authors to sell books very well, but Facebook is the only other channel with double digit effectiveness out of a hundred percent and in both discovery and sales. Now, before I lose all of you that are falling asleep with all this marketing stuff, I just want you to understand what that means. That means that when I look at Facebook, it has a 14% effectiveness rate for discovery and a 14% effectiveness rate for sales. That means that out of 100%, they do those two things well. Twitter, on the other hand, has a 1% rating for discovery and a 4% rating for sales. And I, you know, I use Twitter because I'm a nonfiction writer, and it's a totally different ballgame for nonfiction people. <laughs> But, um, and I always get hate mail from people who say, I sell books on Twitter. And I'm like, I, I know you can sell books on Twitter, but you'll never sell nearly as many books on Twitter if you just forget about it and go over to Facebook. Because to be effective on Twitter, you have to tweet five to seven times a day because an average tweet only has an 18 minute life peak. 
18 minutes. I Facebook, thought it was even less. Like, I think uh, I thought it was like three minutes or something crazy. It's well, bad. Whatever it is, it's not good. Reach its peak, it, it's 18 minutes right now. I just looked it up last week because I was writing a piece for somebody. Um, Facebook's is two and a half hours, which is much mm. better. And, and so I think that when you look at the work it takes on each one of these platforms to effectively engage, that's what we're talking about here, right? You got to win the right to sell by engaging first. My money's on Facebook because 80% of the people are there and because I don't have to work as hard to engage people there so I can sell. And plus, they've got commerce tools like, like the best. And now with the new shop tab, I mean, they're just the place to be. Now, once you get your fiction presence established there and you still want to use Instagram, or I have a lot of authors that like Pinterest because they have kind of pinterest e kind of books, like cozy uh, culinary writers. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, you know, recipes and food pictures and all that kind of stuff work really well for them. So it just depends on where you're at in your platform. Do you have time for all the rest of that stuff? Um, if you do, great. But I tell you what, I've never, and we just um, had an author on the podcast yesterday, and she was saying that this idea of selling more books with less social media really saved her. Um, mm. She was she had FOMO big time, and she was worried that she had to be on Instagram, and she had to be tweeting, because people have been telling authors this for a long time. And she said when she quit all that and just set up her outpost there, you know, she still has a profile, but she does not engage. And just really focused in on Facebook and worked hard there and then worked hard on building her email list. Her, her career really started to take off because, n- number one, she had more time. She wrote more books. Number two, she was more confident in her marketing. And number three, she was using the tools more effectively. So she was engaging more. So, again, another really super long answer. But I really do think that you have to look at those markers first before you decide because we're talking about For somebody like me who's a minimalist, I'm looking at where can I get the best bang for my buck? And my buck is time, it's money, it's skill. I mean, you know, I have to know how to do all this stuff, plus all the the, the work it takes for me to keep up with the changes on all these platforms. So I think social media can be a huge time suck, and I think you have to be really careful how much time you devote to it there. I'd much rather see authors just do one channel really super well. That makes so much sense. And I think I like hearing the data piece because that's something that I think really convinces people where, you know, I like to tell people, try to find that place where you have something you like. Because if you really, really hate something, you know, you could change. I mean, I know people who've hated Facebook and then grow to love it but you know, if you really hate something and it's just going to be pulling teeth and you need to find some, but if it's not going to sell, okay. Email list is the most effective thing to sell. Like as far as like the, the data and research I've seen, because those fans are the most engaged with you. So if you can get people there, okay, then you're fine. You know, if you don't want to use something like Facebook, but I think that data, you know, we can't ignore that. And so we need to know like, okay, but here's what you're missing out on. You're missing out on like what you said, these pieces, of the funnel that are so important. And I think something you touched on was the idea of this, the, the commerce and kind of the Facebook ads, I think is something I've just started to delve more into, but I think it's really important to note that I had somebody just yesterday and she's, she's not a writer. She's a fiction or not fiction. I'm sorry, a beach body coach. So she's not writing books. She's doing this. And she was talking about how she needs to, everybody on her team said she needs to do this and she needs to do this and she needs to do this. And she's like, I have to build up my page because I, I want to run ads. And I was like, Oh, uh, just, stop. Like you can actually run ads to people that do not like your page. And she was like, what? (laughs) And it was this whole like realization that, um, she could be a little bit more freed up because she has huge, crazy engagement on Instagram. And again, she's not selling books, but she's getting her engaged people there. But I was like, I was talking to her about using the targeting features in Facebook ads, not necessarily to build up her page, but to get people to discover her. And then bring her to bring them to where she is. And so, even if you really can't stand some of these platforms like Facebook, the tools for discovering your audience and connecting with people like, again, you don't have to have the biggest page because that's, I think, one of the things that people think is 
it is really hard and it is to build a Facebook page, but there's also Facebook groups. And there's also, again, this ability to target people that don't like your page. Even, you know, so if you have a small page, you still have the power of Facebook ads to reach people. And so I kind of want to end by talking about, and we can talk about Facebook ads or other things, whatever aspect of this, but this idea of connecting with actual readers on these social media platforms, um, and we could stick to just Facebook or wherever, but I think the an issue I constantly see writers struggling with is they connect with other writers and they don't find readers. And we know if 80% or whatever of adults are on Facebook, it's not just writers on Facebook, and writers read too, but we want to connect not just with writers groups, we want to find the actual people who are interested in what we write. So what are some of the recommendations you might have for, you know, kind of effectively using social media so that we're not just getting in those author groups and then hanging out there trying to sell our books to other authors who aren't really all that interested? Well, I think the first thing we have to have is kind of like how we started this out. You have to have a mindset change. Um, Authors like to go find other authors because they don't want to connect with their fans. Um, a good number of authors are introverts and it's a lot easier to connect with your peers than it is to connect with people that, that you're paranoid of that you don't think might not like you or, you know, it's, it's um, I've worked with a lot of introverts to help them get over that on social media. And it's not as hard as it sounds, but it's still a little bit like pulling teeth. Um, It's easier to connect with your peers and you should be connecting with your peers, but you certainly shouldn't be spending more time, on any kind of social media connecting with your peers than you do with your readers. Uh, because then, then you've left that idea. So, well, no, I shouldn't say that. Let's, let's put a caveat on that. If you want to use social media to sell books, you shouldn't be connecting with authors more than you're connecting with readers. Because again, it's a time management thing. Let's get real about how much of a time suck this whole thing just really is. And, and, you know, you need to do things like, Turn off your notifications, and we're not going to go into productivity, but it, you, we need to start with the idea that I'm on social media first and foremost to connect with my fans, second to connect with, my, with, with other authors, that for my author business anyway. And so some of the things that we want to think about, it, and you just sparked one idea, um, a lot of authors have visual books. There, there may be some nonfiction people here that we're talking to. I don't know. But the thing is, is if you love Instagram because you love Facebook, you need to make Facebook into your Instagram. Because I think the one thing that we miss in social media is that we can actually do what we are comfortable with doing there. We don't have to find another platform to go do it. So if I love Instagram, then my Facebook page needs to become a photo album. Mm-hmm. It, it, and I want to engage around visuals and then I want to, you know, whatever it takes to engage both you and your fans, that's really what you want to be taking a look at. I think that the mistake that we make is thinking that um, I like Instagram, so I want to be on Instagram all the time. I like Twitter, so I'm going to be on Twitter all the time. Go with the numbers first and then find a way to replicate what it is that you like about that other platform on Facebook. And I'm not, I I don't own any stock in Facebook. I don't work for Mark Zuckerberg. I just know that that's where the people are. So as far as discovering, having new people discover you on Facebook ads are a great way. But then again, if you have an author network built up, that's another great way. You can be doing little get togethers with other authors. Building a page organically is hard work. Building a page using ads that are geared towards building your page are totally a different deal. Um, you can accelerate that by buying ads. You can hang in there and not if you don't have a budget and do it organically. But if you do want to do it organically, it's going to be a little bit more of a worry, uh, not a worry, but a, a workload. But just make sure you build your page correctly so that you educate yourself, so that you're you're making best use of all the sales tools. You understand what engaging content looks like. I know my audience really well. I know what kind of content they like. I know how often I have to post on Facebook to get maximum engagement. And then just start doing it. You know, I mean, it's just one of those things where you can wish all you want. You know, if wishes were horses. <laughs> Beggars would ride, right? So we got to do the work. 
there's no other substitute for getting out there and doing the work. But I think any social media platforms culture can be replicated on Facebook, except for those platforms that people like to call social media, but they're not really. And that's Snapchat and WhatsApp, because those are text message platforms, not true social media platforms. So you, you, can, you can make Facebook into Instagram or Pinterest or whatever you want if you don't feel like you have the time to spend on all those other platforms. But So that's to answer your question. That's where a lot of this, I have to be me on social media can come in. You, you don't want to be somebody else on Facebook. You want to be you because your authentic person will draw your fans to you. I think of Ronnie, um, Ronnie Lauren, who's a, a, a romance writer. We had her on the podcast one time. She writes erotic romance. And she was an uh, athlete in high school. She played basketball. And one of the things that she can do really well is um, twirl a basketball on her finger. And so one day she's just messing around and she thought, oh, I'm going to make a video of this. So she made a video of herself twirling a basketball on her finger. It was one of the most engaged uh, posts she had on Facebook. It's just, we, we, we kind of scoot by all the things that like that, you know, we don't think of things like that because we think, oh, I, I'm, I can hear it now. I'm so uninteresting. Nobody cares what I do during the day. Nobody wants to see a picture of my dog. Nobody wants, you know, you're wrong. I'm telling you, you're wrong. People buy your books. They want to know about you. They want to interact with you. They want to connect with you and find a way to do that. That helps you be your authentic self. Yes, absolutely. And that made me think of like the other thing that I think authors and really kind of every bloggers do this as well. When you get your Facebook page and you just post links to it, buy my books, read my blog post, buy my books, read my blog post. And if you are doing that, yeah, exactly. No one, you're not going to have engagement. And then Facebook, it has this algorithm, right? It's kind of scary. And if you like do that kind of thing and nobody's engaged with your page, it just makes it harder. It just makes it harder for you to get engagement because Facebook's getting these signals that nobody cares. So right. if, if you got crickets on Facebook, you're going to have a hard time. You really, when you're first starting to build your page, you really need to pay attention to what people like, click, comment, and share, and do more of that. You know, people are always asking me how to write good content. I say, go to your insights, go to the post page. Um, all those columns are sortable. Sort the post by engagement. Look at what gets the top engagement and just go do more of that. <laughs> do whatever works. I mean, it's, it's a, it's not, you can't game it. There's no way to game that algorithm, but you can sure juice it if that makes any sense. So, you know, do what people want and, you know, find that in that, in my Facebook course, I talk about the intersection between what you want and what your fans want, but yet you still have to be that authentic self. So you just make sure that you, that you know that it's work and you're going, you know, you'll get it you'll get it after a while. It's, it's something you learn. It's not magic that only Mark Zuckerberg knows that you can actually learn this stuff. That's awesome. Well, this has been really helpful. And I think just a good dose of reality, but not one that's overwhelming to people. Like I think people can walk away from this kind of saying, okay, I know where data is. I've got some ideas, but I don't feel like defeated. Whereas a lot of times I think that's how social media leaves us. We get exhausted by it because we do think we have to be everywhere or we think we have to do these certain things to be good at this platform. And I love kind of the really practical tips. And I will link to, you have a really great course. It's almost like a mini course, but it's really in depth on Facebook pages. And so for those of you guys who are like, okay, I got to get my Facebook page game going. <laughs> I'll make sure I link to that because it's really helpful in terms of setting it up and doing all that stuff. And this was not meant to be a big ad for that. And that's not how you are, but you created this course because you know the data and that's where people need to be and people need help and are asking you those same questions again and again. And they're also asking me these questions. And so rather than answer you guys, I'm also did a Chris's course because it's fantastic for getting that set up. But thank you so much for taking the time to help kind of demystify this whole idea of, of not getting a readership and not selling your books. Cause I think it's, uh, you made it sound very, very simple and manageable. So thank you. Well, I'm glad. Thanks for having me. It's always a joy. 
So hopefully after listening to this episode, you aren't thinking, man, I really wish I liked Facebook more (laughs) Uh, because Facebook really is where it's at according to the data. But I don't think that has to be bad news. I am not a huge fan of investing and building up your Facebook page. I think it needs to be there. And Chris has a really great course. I'm not an affiliate for it. It's just a great course that I've gone through on building up your Facebook page. So if that's something you want to do, it's a really great resource specifically for the writers out there, but kind of goes through all of the setup and the way you can set up tabs and all the just different settings that you might have missed when you're doing your Facebook page. But I have been just testing ads and doing different things with Facebook. So there's a ton of tools in there. So I see why this is a platform that really works. So even if you love another thing like Instagram, it doesn't mean you have to stop using it, but I think it's really important to take our point that you need to go where the data is. And then if you can kind of recreate your favorite feel on a different platform, Now, that doesn't mean that your people will follow you because I just had a client this week who has a ton of followers on Instagram and she's like, I can post the same kinds of things on Facebook and no one cares. But on Instagram, she has this really thriving community. So, you know, you have to do what works, but it's really important to think about this data, especially if you're an author, this matters. And Chris really knows her stuff. So if you want to find more links and connect with Chris and get more information in the show notes, you can go to creativewriting.com forward slash 110 for episode 110. I don't have a ton of announcements this week, but I do want to give a big shout out to my patrons and our featured community member. The featured community member for the week is Kelly Grant of the Grant Life and PinningPartners.com. And I actually personally know Kelly and met her at Blog Elevated, my first blogging conference I ever went to, which really did have a huge impact on my life. And Kelly also has had a huge impact on my life. Just, I've learned so much from her, but she's also just one of those trustworthy people that you can work with and partner with and talk to about your blog woes. And so she's been fantastic and recently launched her own podcast, the Pinning Partners podcast, which is all about, you guessed it, Pinterest. And I know some of you guys just attended her workshop on finding keywords for Pinterest. I shared that in my weekly quick fix. And if you're not signed up for that, you need to be. So you can go to creativewriting.com forward slash quick fix. Kelly, I am glad you are here. And because I'm really new to having this whole Patreon thing, I totally forgot to read off all of the names of my supporters. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that now. And this is just a huge thank you to the people who are monthly supporters of the show. And if you would like to be a monthly supporter for the show, you can find out all the details and the benefits to you by going to creativewriting.com forward slash Patreon. And there are some fun things like a private community and getting the shout outs on the show. So here we go. Huge thank you to Jocelyn Brown, Susie Taylor Oakley, Stephanie Nickel, Mary Dennis, Ruthie Kirwan, Pamela Hill, Marianne West, Tanya Goya, Elizabeth Edwards, Jenny Kokas, Matt Brady, Mira Kothand, Roland Denzel, Christine Griffin, Andy Cumbo Floyd, Tisha Messing, Christine Goodner, Sarah Kennedy, Sally Olson, Jenna Taylor, Cheryl Russell, Chris Loomis, David Snyder, Nicole Lee, Katie Andrasky, Marie Osborne, Kelly Grant, and my community manager, Matthew McCarrick. So again, if you want to find out more about how you can partner with me to support the show and all of the work that I do at Creative Writing, and also what cool benefits you get, you can go to creativewriting.com forward slash Patreon. I'm so glad that you guys listened today and tuned into the show. Do you know what would really help me if you like the show is share it with a friend. I know podcasters are always saying leave a rating and review. That's great. It's kind of like that social proof. But the real things that help are you guys telling your friends, spread the word, tell them if you enjoy this podcast and if it would be something that would help them. Thank you guys again so much for listening and I hope you have an inspired week. Ah.